Before we start uh, a discussion, I just want to spend a minute um, drawing your attention to this very beautiful artwork, which is by Sue Williams Accord, who is here. And um, I came across her paintings, thought they were quite extraordinary. Um, uh, and uh, some of her work, uh, well, she'll talk about it uh, very, very quickly. Um, but she, she creates landscapes, this is not one of them, creates landscapes which, when you look at them another way, have a human face. And I found them interesting from a neurological point of view as well as being... Uh, an interesting combination of being beautiful and witty, which is not so common in, in modern art. So, uh, Sue, do you want to come and uh, just yes. very quickly oh, say something? Quickly. I mean, one of the things about this is that it's got a lot of detail, and in a way to appreciate its beauty, awesome. one needs to see it perhaps a little bit more uh, close up. But um, yeah. it, it brings together actually three things that I think are, are, are really terrific and aren't always found together today beauty, skill, and, and wit, um, and feeling, longing. <laughs> Did you want to say something? Or? Well, I like reappropriate historical romantic paintings, um, and I recreate them. Um, I'm kind of, I'm using all the things that, uh, that Ian has um, talked about to do with the, the sunlight, and, uh, and uh, this, this actual piece here, is actually an 18th century painting by a guy called Richard Wilson. Um, and the painting uh, is called uh, Landscape with Hermits, and it originally depicts hermits <laughs> in contemplation by a very dark pool. And right in the background of the painting, um, is, is, is right amongst the trees, is a tiny little speck of light in his, his work. And it's where this ceremony is taking place. It's like a, a procession or a... a uh, some kind of ritualistic ceremony. Now, what I've done is kind of reconfigured and represented that work in <coughs> graphite mm -hmm. with paint. So there's a real kind of the, the actual um, figurative element is, is also a form within the space. Mm. Um, I thought it was really nice that, that it just happened that your series, you, this is not one of those, I think, no, no. but you have a series called Desire and Longing, yes. and that, that just happened to be what <laughs> I. This is called Desire and Longing. Oh, it is? This painting oh. is actually called Desire and Longing. Oh, right, OK. Right. Um, I'll so keep out of it, yeah. And essentially, your wanting and longing it is the way that I would think about desire and longing in the sense of this painting. Um, I think that this picks up on the, the painting in a way, and the, the, the central distinction between desire and longing. Uh, and I thought you brought out very clearly the difference between something that, as it were, impels us from behind mm. in a mechanistic way mm. and something which draws us forward mm. um, <coughs> and longing in the sense you so brilliantly articulated does just that, draws us forward. Mm. Mm. Um, and that connects with the idea of tele teleology as opposed to pure mechanistic exactly. organization. But um, the question I'd like to ask really is, is connected with I think the religious subtext, which, which was in your remarks this afternoon was more than a subtext, was quite uh, near the surface, but perhaps in the master and his emissary, remain, you remained a little bit reticent. But hmm. I think clear to anyone who read them, or should have been clear, that, <laughs> that, was, uh, that it was informed by, partly informed by religious yeah. um, sensibility. But uh, I guess, um, you hinted at various points that what draws us forward is, teleologically is involves a two-way process yes. so that it's not just that we no. put it in religious terms, not just that we long for God, no. but that he longs for us. Yes. Um, and, and so the goal is personal, uh, at least ultimate reality which is drawing us forward is, is in some sense personal. Um, now that, I guess, is a point which many philosophers would dig their heels in about. They, they, they would say something like, even if one concedes there are teleological pools of this kind, that's still a big step to say that there's a two-way uh, interpersonal of some kind 
or potentially a two-way relation here. And I take it that religion, at least theism, anything remotely like traditional theism, is going to have to insist on, on just that two-way element. But I just wonder how you get that out of longing and teleology, um, or whether it's an additional step. Oh, I, I see. A left yes. way of putting it. No, no. Um, <laughs> Well, uh, you're touching on something that is, uh, to me, a central point about the, <laughs> if I can use such an expression, the epistemology of the right hemisphere, its way of approaching an understanding of the world, which is that um, uh, nothing is in isolation and we're not in isolation from what we observe. There is always a two-way process. We are connected with... Um, what we observe, and it's not just that we affect the what is observed, but in some way what we observe will affect us. And indeed, um, uh, from my recent very amateur reading in, in physics, that seems to be a concept that a lot of physicists would say was an accurate um, uh, reflection of the nature of, um, of, of, of the universe as being re revealed um, by um, quantum physics, that there is a kind of two-way interaction. But it's essential, in, in a way, in, in the right hemisphere. It's what I call betweenness, which is that two things come together not in an additive way, um, and it's not even that you add the two things and a connection, but the two things, when connected, create a new whole, which is more than the sum of the parts. Uh, it's a sort of... Um, uh, it's an unfortunate uh, way of putting it, but it's a sort of dialectical idea, I suppose, yes. But what we're connected to might... I mean, for example, on a Buddhist conception, might be a, a flux or an... Or an impersonal process. Yes. So it wouldn't be anything which itself. So the human has longing for nirvana, but yes, nirvana, nirvana can't have a longing for no. Well, I mean, we're in very very deep water here, but I think that um, one of I mean one way it would take me out of probably where we ought to be, but. Um, it, in, I was invited very kindly by um, the World Congress of Faiths um, in the person of, of Brian uh, um, to, talk, to give the Young Husband Lecture this year. And I, I talked about the problem of the one and the many. Um, and my thrust was that although often when one philosophizes, one sees unification, simplicity, stasis and eternity as the sort of trumping sort of elements in, in reality, um, that most of the business of the cosmos seems to me to be about differentiation, multiplicity, superabundance, um, the forming of, of, of the many. And that both are needed and that one uh, takes part in the other. And so uh, coming to the question about the individual versus the sort of, as it were, one, uh, one of the only ways I can understand creation is um, because I strongly intuit that there is a divine something. Why would that divine something go to the trouble of creating this phenomenal world, a phenomenological world, um, if it already knew and had everything, and it, it must be an overwhel uh, an outwelling or overflowing of some um, forceful creation that desires the, the, the unfolding of this w w somewhat sterile one into all the, the manifoldness of things. Now, if it's, if it's that, it's not going to turn its back on the individuation that occurs. It's not that the individuation is an unfortunate... I mean, this is my... Yes. The gripe I had with, 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 with a, a, a probably completely misunderstood form of Buddhism was the idea that somehow the self was a, um, a problem, you know, a sort of um, stumbling block. And, of course, certain kinds of conception of the self clearly are. Um, but some uh, sense of the self is, it seems to me, important. It seems to me what we're here to do is to grow that selfhood, um, fulfil it, um, which we do better or worse. But that, it, that at the end of that process, although we die, that something or other that, it, that is what we have done with our bit of the cosmos is taken back into the whole. So the, while we're here, the bit of the 
conscious cosmos, because I believe consciousness is the sort of basic, basic um, given of the universe, um, uh, then the, the bit that we occupy is, um, is in relation with that whole. It's not completely separate from it. It's rather like a, a pseudopod on the membrane of an amoeba. It's a sort of outpouching of the, of the, of the, the flow of consciousness in which it self-reflects when you're in the middle of it. That is your mortal reflection. People can transcend that to see that they're connected to something beyond, from which we're never completely severed. Is it? No, thank you very much. Is it important, do you think, about longing that it is unfulfillable? I mean, sometimes the way you spoke, but you did very beautifully, I'm not complaining, but sometimes wanting was for something specific which could be completed, yes. but longing was for something which almost seemed to be by definition unobtainable. Now, does that mean it's always better to travel, <laughs> hopefully, than ever to arrive? And is that something that, that is essential to, to longing, which would make some religious senses of longing, some theistic senses, uh, feeling complete in a way that you, you never, as it were, see the face of God. Do you see what I mean? Yes, that's a very good point. If I may answer with a geometric image, um, it seems to me the approach of wanting and the approach of the left hemisphere is as always linear. Um, whereas it seems to me the approach uh, towards whatever it is that the longing is for might be an asymptotic process. In other words, it doesn't finally arrive, but is constantly traveling and, and always becoming. Because I believe in, well, I mean, you have to put up with this, but I believe God is also becoming rather than being. Um, and so, uh, yeah, I, 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 I think it's not so much that it's sort of frustrated in the sense of unfulfilled, but that it in nature is an infinite game, and an infinite game by, by definition is never concluded. Does, is that all right? Yes, yes, yes. This is something that we discussed at our last seminar as well, and that there are two ways of thinking about the structure of insatiable desire, and this is something that <clears throat> I've thought a lot about in connection with Levinas, who also makes a distinction between need and desire corresponding to your want versus longing distinction. And the trajectory that I think um, we're wanting to get away from in the context of understanding... Or longing to get away from yeah. it. <laughs> <laughs> it's one where it's like that and there's an object that's forever out of reach and you're trying to grasp it and possess it. Mm. And that would be the trajectory of want in your ordinary sense. Yes. Maybe it would correspond to potential infinity or something like that. Right. And then the alternative is um, it's not that the object is forever out of reach and you're trying to get at it. It's that you're already engaged with it. Absolutely. Absolutely desiring yes. and the object itself going back to what you're saying yes. is a desiring is is a kind of desire so yes. that you're desiring desire and you're part of it yes. and that's like an actual infinity it's more like that yes that kind of trajectory i like that very much you know, I, th I think that that mm. makes perfect sense yes yes um, thank you yes can I've... i now ask my real question <laughs> so yeah. It's really a question about how you see the relation between science and philosophy or science and metaphysics. Because when you began and talked about the way in which the scientist longs or desires in a really deep sense, I immediately thought of John's distinction between the epistemology of involvement and the epistemology of detachment. And John's idea, as you know, is that the epistemology of detachment applies to a certain kind of scientific investigation mm -hmm. where you're thinking about things in terms of parts as opposed to wholes, so you're taking mm. an atomistic approach rather than a holistic one. Mm. So when you started talking in that way, I immediately thought, I wonder how that relates to John's point. Mm. Mm. And towards the end, when you made that distinction between modern science and science, mm. I, I think you were suggesting that modern science involves that epistemology of detachment Mm. that you wanted to move us back to? Exactly. Okay. That's why I started really with uh, Chargaff as my uh, sort of archetypal scientist. Um, indeed, his wonderful uh, 
autobiographical memoir called Heraclitean Fire. Mm -hmm. He talks about the way in which he came to science mm -hmm. and how um, he conceives the true scientist to be this person who is not deterred by the idea of unattainability or darkness and the need for those things. Uh, whereas it seems to me that nowadays an awful lot of science is um, his uh, flashing a torch around and finding a lumber room. Um, so I, I wanted to, everything um, has its right hemisphere and its left hemisphere manifestation, if you like. And there is, there is left hemisphere kind of science, which I regret. And there's a kind of difference, tradition in science, which I think most of the great scientists have exemplified. Uh, of something beyond that. But would that mean that the God question is, after all, a scientific question? No. So well, but it, would, but it would mean that... It depends what you mean by science, then. Yeah. Um, <coughs> it's, it's, uh, the trouble with science is that it is generally, however conceived, a matter of pinning something down, which is effectively what... I mean, one very um, soundbite way of thinking about the difference between the left hemisphere's approach and the right is the left hemisphere is constantly trying to narrow down to a certainty, whereas the right hemisphere is constantly trying to open up to a possibility. And it seems to me that the approach to God has got to be opening up to a possibility, although tempered by the, the need to try and make things at least partly. You know, they've always got to be balanced. But one has always got to be in service to the other. It's not an equal partnership. So that would be the way I think of it. But I like the earlier one. And, and the, 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 uh, you, when you said, you know, we're, we're already engaged, it, it, even perhaps when we don't know we are with, with that quest for God. Um, a, a film that never um, ceases to offer me uh, rich, rich metaphors is um, Tarkovsky's Solaris. And there's a moment where the astronaut Chris is being sent out to this planet, which turns out to be something like a conscious being. And, and, he, and he says, he's sort of on the radio to control, and he says, um, when are we going? And they said, you are already underway. And it's quite a simple moment, but like so many lines in that film, they go, wow. Um, anyway. Apparent lack of neurological evidence that the two hemispheres operate in this way. That's just an aside. I don't think it's that important. I think what you're really pointing to is there are two different ways of thinking about fundamental aspects of reality, meaning, value, God, and so on. So let, let's forget the question of whether the two parts of the brain actually do operate in these ways. It's just the two ways of thinking. My question to you is this. Um, I think what we need to do is define what each part or each side of the brain, as it were, is trying to do, and then ask whether it does it successfully and whether it could benefit from the input of the other side. And I think what you're trying to say is, yes, we could all have to be held in balance and synthesis and you need both sides. And, and most theologians who talk in this way would agree with you. But I wonder whether we can just reach that conclusion so quickly or whether it might require a bit more left hemisphere thinking to get there. Because if we, think, if we are trying to ask about fundamental questions of the way reality actually is, in terms of what, um, what it's made of, whether, the, whether it's theological, whether there's a God, whether there are objective values and so on, um, then we have to agree that whatever truths the one side came to, if it did, must be compatible with whatever truths the other side comes to, if it does, on the simple grounds that truth is always reconcilable with all other truth. Now the question is, what way of thinking gets us to those truths most efficiently or most sensitively? I can well see the merits of both approaches, because I, I know in my own mind how the two sides conflict and how they can't actually reach an accommodation. But then my feeling is that in the end, what the left side says is, OK, let's listen to what the right side says and, and take it as on what its sensitivities, but ask difficult questions about legitimate inference, for example. Can you, for example, really infer from the fact that we have these intuitions and perfect sense of purpose that there really is a God? I mean, after all, that, that has massive implications for the way that causality works, for, for questions about time and purpose, all these things. Anything with, anything with improbable implications must itself be regarded as improbable. And my feeling is that when the right side takes over, it looks at these questions in isolation, it forgets the rest or it explains it away, saying, oh, this, this is just a particular way of knowing that we need, and forgets what the left side can, can actually add in this, which is a scientific way of thinking. Now, much of it might be accused of being philistine and scientific and a bit plodding, and I, I do recognise that. It's, these are perfectly, uh, you know, proper... Uh, 
critical in their place. I can't help feeling you do, in the end, need a sort of tough-minded left hemisphere side to get any this off the ground. And by the way, theists have the left hemisphere people among, as well as atheists. I mean, Swinburne's a completely left hemisphere. <laughs> 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 so, so, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm taking over a whole range of issues, but that might be... Uh, I'm sorry, but I mean, it's impossible for me to answer so many questions, but I would say they are all answered in the book. I mean, it's starting from the... Uh, the uh, idea that the difference between the right and left hemispheres has been sort of debunked. Uh, that idea has itself been debunked, um, largely by me. Uh, <laughs> but I have recognition from, you know, uh, important neuroscientists like Rad um, Ramachandran and Panksepp and so on. It's not just a flaky idea. In the book, I gather 2,500 uh, uh, scientific papers, which took me 20 years to gather and process. And it's not the distinction that you kept referring to when you said right and left, um, which was something like reason versus um, emotion or something like that. But that is absolutely, all those questions are dealt with because that is not the distinction. Um, and also that I'm not at all here to say that we don't need our reasoning mind. Uh, uh, that has nothing to do with it. But it's just that um, a certain kind of sterile rationalism thinks that it knows the answers to everything, which it doesn't. And it's trying to redress um, an imbalance in our culture that I wrote the book. But it is 600 pages and it took me 20 years, so I can't synthesise it for you now. Is it because their right hemispheres are somehow subdued or the left hemisphere dominant? Is this a biological or anatomical explanation of the difference and dispute between theism and atheism, or more broadly between those who are spiritually switched on and those who are spiritually switched off? Um, so the question was, is atheism the product of what, a certain way of... Over-dominant left hemisphere, or, um, I mean, actually... Yes. Yes. You, you <laughs> <laughs> yes, I'm here. I'm here. Oh, right. 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 <laughs> right. Um, yes. Uh, well, I mean, the only thing that I can bring to bear on that is that um, research shows that people with autism um, tend to not believe in God, and people with autism show at least at the phenomenological level, rather what it's like if your right hemisphere is disabled. So, um, I mean, that might have a bearing on it. I, I don't like to stigmatise people who perfectly reasonably are atheists as having something wrong with their brains, and uh, it takes all sorts. Um, and there are certain kinds of believers who are more worrying to me even than atheists, provided um, they're not rabid about it. Um, rabid atheists are as bad as rabid anything. But um, there's more common ground between people who think of themselves as atheists and people, you know, than, than, uh, than the religious than is often thought. Do you have a follow-up there? Uh, well, yeah, I suppose I'm, I'm also interested in... Um, it's not so much as I would imagine that people are just sort of wired differently, but rather that there might be aspects of our culture that um, would contribute to, you know, perhaps overdeveloping certain. Um, well, if we're going to kind of verify it, that would that would develop, you know, one part of the brain, um, and perhaps um, you know under underdevelop or, or let go the other. Um, side of the brain. And I, I, just, I just wonder how far um, you want to anchor this in, 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 in the theory of, of the brain, because it does seem that all sorts of, mm. you know, epistemological questions will, will follow from that. Um, you know, how, how robust is this? How, um, how robust, this? yes. And, well, um, you, you, everyone has to... A piece of your theory in terms of, the, you know, accounting for this whole picture of, um, you know, religion and debates about religion and some people's complete inability to countenance mm. religious ideas. Um, I'm just interested in, in, in hearing a bit more about how well, that thank fits, you. Yes, fits good. Fits into yeah, okay. Well, the first thing to say is that it's not about growing or not growing bits of the brain. Um, yeah. You know, people's brains will look the same, largely speaking, 
over very long time periods. I mean, they vary from individual to individual, but I'm not suggesting that something has happened structurally to our brains, although it will do eventually because structure follows um, uh, the, the way in which one uses it. But, uh, but um, my point is that if I am right that the two hemispheres, one of the fundamental differences between them is the kind of attention, narrow beam, highly focused, precise attention to detail and fragments, and the other is this very broad, un sustained, vigilant, open attention, and all the evidence, I mean, I invite you to look at it, but from, from all the animal ethologists are very clear about this historically, um, from an evolutionary point of view, and no neurologist anywhere in the world, it's not controversial, no neurologist you will find will, di will disagree with me that they offer different kinds of attention to the world. Now, because most scientists are not particularly interested in the philosophy of attention, they think of it tend to as a function of, the, of a machine, the brain, um, I would say there are consequences. I think most philosophers would agree with me that attention changes the nature of what is attended to. That is certainly something I argue strongly in The Master and His Emissary. Um, so if it's true that the attention differs, and if attention changes the world, then you have two subtended realities, if you like, which are kept uh, together in normal life in such a way that we're not aware that we're juggling these things. But as soon as something happens to one <laughs> hemisphere or another, you won't find a neuro neurologist or psychiatrist or neuropsychologist anywhere in the world which will tell you different than that there is a huge difference between what happens if you have a, a blow here in the left hemisphere and a blow here in the right hemisphere. So the idea that there is no difference is a non-starter. From a purely technical point of view, the two hemispheres are different shapes, different weights, they have different conformations, they have different cytoarchitecture, they have different greater white ratio, they rely on different um, preponderances of neuroendocrine hormones and neurotransmitters. So the, the idea that they're just the same is about as stupid as trying to say the, the earth is flat. Nobody can say that and get away with it, except people who just say, oh, it's all old hat, which means they haven't bothered to look at it. You know, it actually takes a very long time to look at this. I devoted most of my um, last 20 years to doing that. And there aren't many people in the world who've bothered to do that. So actually knowing whether these differences are there is not something that most people are actually equipped to say except a few people who are, I think, very prominent figures. And there's a debate between them about whether I'm on the right track or not. But, but you know, I, I just want to get away from the idea that it's an add-on, that how far can you take this brain thing. If I'm right, it follows. If I'm right that the attention is different, and that's not disputed, and if attention changes reality, and I don't think that, well, people might dispute it, but I wouldn't accept that, then there are going to be differences in the phenomenological world as conceived. And that affects everything. It affects time and space. In fact, I'm writing a book at the moment on the way the two hemispheres see time, space, motion, value, and I'm hoping eventually to come on to the divine. So I know it's a ridiculously huge topic, but m the point I'm really making is that if I'm right, there is no two ways about it. It is going to affect all those things and the way we look at them. I, I suppose, I mean, I, that, that all sounds um, just really interesting and, and quite, quite compelling and persuasive. Um, one thing I'd be really interested in, um, through my own contribution to this project, has been looking at religious practices, meditation and prayer and contemplation, which are really practices of, of cultivating attention. Um, and so this idea that um, attention can be changed through practice, deepened through practice, and that this you know, actually gives, um, <coughs> reveals a, a different kind of world um, and um, you know, um, facilitates self-knowledge, facilitates insight into the nature of reality. That's, that's all very um, familiar to me and sort of e easy to act up. Well, I imagine so, yes. Uh, but one, one um, I suppose one, but, but so, so in that sense, that, that, that all sounds, you know, like it, it sounds good and like it fits, but there also seems to be a danger of, um, by focusing on 
grey in this way. It seems that actually you've got a possibility then of a, of a reductive, um, actually very scientific and, and very um, yeah. left hemisphere kind of interpretation of what religion mm. is, but it's just about... Um, but, but excuse, sorry, before you go on any more, can I just say, I never said that it's just anything at all. And I don't. I never said that it's just anything at all. My whole thrust, my whole thrust is anti-reductionist. I'm using the brain or knowledge or understanding of the brain to show that only one part of the brain and the one that literally sees and understands least thinks in a reductive way. So I, I'm, I'm using brain science to actually get beyond itself. Yes, that, well, that's what's really interesting. Because I, I know that, you know, that's what... I don't, I don't think that you're offering a reduction of account, but then it seems that... I suppose I want to know what exactly is the difference between your account. I can see that they have a different spirit. Um, obviously, you've given a very kind of heretic and spiritually um, attuned talk about these, you know, huge questions. Um, and I know that you personally are, are receptive to, to all these ideas. Um, and yet, from a sort of epistemological or methodological point of view, um, I just wonder how you would distinguish yourself from a, a, a sort of reductive account of religion <laughs> being somehow sort of mappable onto the brain. You know, you see those pictures sometimes of... Yeah, no, I, 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 I get the point completely, uh, Claire. I, I, out, you know, how yeah. these practices alter the brain. No, I mean, uh, uh, other than referring you to what I've written, I don't know how briefly to counter that, except to say that the whole thrust of what I'm saying is not that our experience can be reduced to the brain, but we all will agree that during this life, whatever consciousness we have is mediated by the brain. Uh, whether it's originated in the brain or mediated by the brain, I believe it's more likely that it's mediated or transduced by the brain than originates in the brain. But it really doesn't matter which. It's going to be affected by the structure of the brain. <coughs> this is not to say that the structure of the brain sort of is like tram lines, but it's more like patterns of migration. If birds are uh, migrating, they tend to follow certain paths which are referable to the underlying terrain and the uh, opportunities it offers for feeding and for nesting and so on. Um, so it's not that the, the, the landscape sort of is their migration or controls their migration, but their migration naturally follows these paths because that's the way the, the, the material world is. And it doesn't mean that a certain bird may not decide to go completely off track and supposed to be landing on sky and ends up in Newfoundland. What I'm really saying is our thoughts are not sort of policed by or reducible to in any sense the brain, but to say that the brain doesn't have any influence on them seems to me to commit the opposite fallacy. One, one of these, one of the distinctions you drew between the two is that wanting seems to have its goal clearly in view all the time. Mm. Wanting and longing seems to be um, striving towards a kind of unknown entity. Um, it sounds quite a lot like um, the kinds of experience longing. This is sounds like the kinds of experience that C.S. Lewis, for example, described. Yeah. Being surprised by joy. Yeah, um, exactly. We actually call it Zainzucht anyway. Yes, yes, exactly. yes. Um, the yearning for one knows not what. So, um, you know, there there are many things in the world that can elicit that kind of yes. that kind of feeling. And, and I just wonder, I guess I wanted to sort of connect this up to um, explicitly the religious um, practice or, or questions. Mm. Let's say one listens to a piece of music and mm. has this has this kind of longing or joy in those terms of elicited emotion. Yeah. Um, if it's, a, if it's a longing that's striving towards something that you can't really characterize, you just know it's beyond whatever you're currently experiencing, mm. um, it seems that, I just wonder what kind of, um, you know, answers there might be to the question, how, one, how does one pursue whatever it is that one seems to long for? I mean, if, if one just continues listening to those sorts of musical works, for example, then one's just going to have the longing elicited in oneself and again and again and again. It might be a kind of, you know, it's a sort of pleasurable experience, but it, it's mm. hard to see how that might get one any closer to whatever the longing is for. 
And I just wonder what you know what what ways there might be of connecting this up to say you know religious practice. Is religious practice a kind of mm. convenient? You know, oh, I've got this longing. Let's try Christianity, say, because it happens to be there in my culture. Or is there some is there some deeper connection to be made between between these these two kinds of Domains, I well, the underlying structure of what I think you were asking is the suggestion that um, it, uh, of a causation, that this thing, will, what does it cause? This is the next step. And I'm saying it's not quite like that, but that something grows between you and your experience of the numinous. And at age 15, it may have one form, but by the time one's 65, it may have a completely different understanding of what that is but it's not that by listening to it you always have the same experience it's rather like you know arriving at the place you started from and knowing it for the first time in the famous phrase Veliot but you know that actually as I've grown older I've listened to pieces of music repeatedly and they they in in subtle ways shift what they speak to me of as um, of course they're bound to be because the process is a is not a unidirectional <laughs> thing having an effect on a thing it's a relationship and relationships are always evolving and one's relationship with god is something that is nourished or stifled it seems to me and that there are certain ways of thinking certain ways of being certain ways of attending that will help to stifle it and then you won't see it, and you'll wonder what all this talk about God is. There are other ways which will nourish it and make it seem not irrational, but at least reasonable, and even likely, and strongly intuitively possible. So just a very quick follow-up. So do you think, in principle, there might be ways entirely devoid of you know, um, practices in, within traditional religions to mature oneself in this kind of, for want of a better word, spiritual way to draw closer to the object of one's longing? Or do you think that, you know, some, some great religious tradition or maybe several of them have to come in somewhere, you know, in, in this kind of quest? Well, I think they don't have to, but I think that for most people they will because they form a repository of a kind of incarnate wisdom about the cosmos. Um, which is expressed through worship, through, through words, through music, through, through ideas, through paintings, through places. And for some people that's not needed, and nor is the sense of fellowship with other people who are following the same path. Um, so there isn't one way of doing this, it seems to me. But I, what I'm suggesting is that what I'm saying is entirely consonant <coughs> with any of the great religious traditions as I understand them. I had a similar impression when I was reading uh, the second part of the Master and this emissary <clears throat> that, that might indicate an ambiguity in terms of your, the concept of God that is in the background. I think there are two types of the concept of longing. The one is the romantic concept. I think we are closer to this concept, <coughs> which I think the con most concise expression <coughs> of this concept you find in Hölderlin's Imperial Fragments where he says, to be united with God would be death. This is a kind of homeostatic concept of longing, uh, uh, which you find it later also in a more explicit way in Wagner, <coughs> Schopenhauer, uh, which means it's a kind of tension, Sehnsucht, and uh, yeah, happiness is the vanishing of pain. And uh, uh, this kind of homeostatic concept is very different from the concept you find, for example, in Meister Eckhart, you refer to Meister Eckhart, or in the Platonic tradition. In the Platonic tradition, you might have a similar concept uh, of longing as a kind of lack. But uh, the Church Fathers had a similar problem in origin in the third century. He basically thought, if I arrive at the vision of God in heaven, then it will be boring, and then the whole thing starts again. Mm -hmm. So, uh, uh, and the Church Fathers tried to find a solution to that. Mm -hmm. And Gregory of Nyssa solution became very important in so far as in Gregory, uh, God is Trinitarian, God is love, and we have to think love, agape, together with eros. And eros in Gregory of Nyssa is no longer an expression of lack. Yeah. It's a desire to be united, and I'm united with the other at the moment when I'm desire. So desire is no longer a lack. And I, wo I wo wonder if, uh, if you are aware that there are different accounts of that, and to what extent this uh, uh, ch would change your understanding of desire. 
Uh, I'd love to have heard you at greater lengths, but obviously that's not uh, possible now. Um, but uh, thanks for the, the heads up. Uh, <laughs> um, I, I, no, I don't think anything you said uh, in any way uh, makes me rethink. Um, what you seem to be suggesting is that longing is rather like my reply to Keith, that it's a sort of asymptotic nature, that it is a constant process. But then, uh, to cut a long story short, because it is a very long story, I believe that, that all is process, that all, including God, as I say, is a becoming, and that um, we and uh, God fulfill one another in this process briefly speaking. So the idea that it ever comes to an end and you are united and that is that is not in the nature of things conceivable. But I mean, obviously, that you've opened up a vast area there that we could have a day or two to mull over. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah, I had a question. You were saying that mm. um, our attention to the world changes the world. Mm. And I was wondering, um, are you in quantum mechanical terms, that's the observer effect, if you like. But I'm talking about something much more homely, um, which is that how we attend to something, um, we only ever see. Uh, seeing is not a passive process in which something uh, is clocked by the retina and then machinery happens and we get it. We go out to meet the world with expectations and what we don't expect to see, we often don't find. Um, and so uh, um, perception is uh, an intellectual process as well. It has, we partake of the process of what we see. And uh, bringing this down to a very simple level, which makes sense um, to, to a lot of people. Um, for example, b behind uh, the house where I live in Scotland, there's a big mountain. Um, and uh, its name, Talisker, it comes from a Norse word meaning sloping rock. And that means that, that tells you that um, a thousand years ago, when the Vikings came down from, from uh, Scandinavia, um, they saw that mountain as a landmark from the sea, a landmark of a treacherous area. Um, to the Picts who were already living there, it was shelter and it was the home of the gods. To people who came there in the 18th century to paint it, it was a you know, many textured form of color and so forth. To geologists, it's a notable example of basaltic columnar um, formation. To a speculator, it's a source of potential wealth. And to a physicist, it's 99.99% .99 space. Um, and the rest is simply something that is probabilistic and we don't know its nature. Now, all, none of those descriptions is false. All of them are entirely true to the object. There are just different ways that object came into being for those observers, depending on their preoccupations, their values, their goals. So that, that's a very down-to-earth way of saying how attention changes the world. Uh, and if you attend to things as if they were machines, you will find, ooh, they're very machine-like. Bingo, I'm right. Whereas if you attend to them in a quite different uh, spirit, you find something else coming forward. It seems we were discussing at last of these me meetings was um, for the Platonists, they, they desire, their desire was in terms of desiring the Platonic forms, and the Platonic forms were very abstract realities. And we talked about for, for the early Christians, the difficulty was thinking about how, with in Jesus Christ, we're presented with a particular that is actually God, and 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 how these two things are related to each other. And I noticed with one of the things you said about longing it sounds quite platonic, and you're talking about yeah. an unknown that we that we long for, but not a personal to the particular. Um, I just wondered if I mean for, for for Augustine, for instance, he says, you know, we know about this from people. We desire particular people, but we don't know them. You know, we don't know everything about no. them. No, of fact, most of what most of a relationship is unknown and no, right. and yeah. future. So, yes. do you think you can hold together? a notion of a particular that you're looking for, where they... Well, yes, I mean, I come back to my sort of the one and the many thing, that they're the manifestations of the same thing, really, but one can't just collapse them, as Plato tended to, into this perfect unified thing, but the, the, that it's 
um, in a more Aristotelian way, its manifestations in the material world are really important and part of the whole business uh, of the cosmos. But it's not, we're not getting anywhere by denying that aspect, which is also a problem I have with Buddhism, that it's all an appearance, but actually it's, you know, we're here not just to go, oh, well, uh, it doesn't really, it doesn't mean anything. We, we, you know, we have to struggle with the complexities of the fact that, and I don't know to, uh, that some Buddhists will say, but that's exactly what true Buddhism says so yeah um, but yeah um, uh, I, 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 I do think that um, uh, well I, 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 there's certain bits in Plato that I like but I don't like this sort of one sidedness so I think that the one and the many can be and of course uh, it was Aris, um, uh, St. Augustine who said uh, see si comprehendis known as Deus if you understand it it's not God you understand and uh, so that is very much my position that it's a journey but one that is never completed it doesn't mean one's going nowhere and it doesn't mean that one's unknowing is anything like ignorance in fact it's the product of knowledge much as there's the innocence of the baby and the innocence of the saint and one of them is achieved through a lot of suffering and the unknowing of the wise person is achieved through that process mm. distinction in the finite game and the infinite game. Mm. Uh, and your use towards the end of what you were saying about play mm. as being the teleological function of life. Uh, and it just struck me that there's a parallel there with the Eastern traditions and the Indian tradition, uh, where it is about play. Mm. Uh, and also, I was just trying to work out the implications of the distinction between the cyclical approach of Eastern traditions and the linear, tradition, the linear approach of Abrahamic traditions and how that fits in. So it was really a sort of a, a, an observation of uh, we'll a take. puzzle in process. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's the best place for a puzzle to be. Um, no, completely agree about the Oriental. Um, uh, uh, observations you made there and very briefly the idea of um, the cyclical versus the linear is something that I could have given a whole talk on um, I alluded to it extremely briefly but it seems to me that that has something to do with the nature of the thought processes of the two hemispheres um, and it struck me in writing the master's hemisphere that that distinction was actually quite fundamental to the nature of reality Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much.